Right learners, welcome to our video today where we are going to continue in module 1.2 and we're now picking up from output. Okay, so we spoke about input, we're looking at our output devices. This brings, you know, gives us the results of processing and the purpose of output is to provide a user with feedback in the interaction with a computing device, provide a user with a more permanent copy of the results and allows the transmission of data between computers and electronic devices. So we have different types of output. We have visual output. Now, these are terms that usually get asked, your soft copy and your hard copy. Our sound output, our touch screen, our touch output, and we have other output as well. So just go through the four categories, uh, make sure you understand what is being meant by that as we go further through this module. Okay, so we look at our display devices. Now, display options that allow the user to make choices, how they interact with the program and operating system. So how things are displayed on the screen. Remember, the display will show you the results of your processing. Now, some advantages, and please, when you think of a display device, think of your monitor, right? It provides immediate feedback. It allows for interaction between the user and the computer. It displays the content so it can e be easily changed or updated. And the text can be enlarged for visually impaired um, users. Some disadvantages, um, output is not permanent because obviously if you change what's on the screen, it's going to move. Right? Output is difficult to share. So I can't, if I, unless I have a massive monitor, or I have a data projector, then I can show everyone what's on my screen. It can lead to eye strain, so you don't want to sit too close to the monitor as well, and the work is not private, because if people are walking or standing over, you know, behind you and things, they can see exactly what's going on. And, in, you know, as is the case in gaming, if you have a very expensive monitor and you have somebody, you know, knock that over and break it, yeah, you know, that's, that's going to be um, quite expensive to replace there. All right, so we can go through the rest. And again, like I say, you need to probably just know like two of these. Okay, when it comes to, again, choosing a display device, there are a number of things, number of things we need to, we need to look at, right? We're going to go through a few of them. So the first one we look at is resolution. Now, the resolution refers to the number of individual dots of color known as pixels contained on a display. It's measured by identifying the number of pixels on the horizontal axis and the number on the vertical axis. So the higher those numbers are, the better the quality of the picture displayed is going to be. Right, then we have our aspect ratio, which is something that gets asked regularly as well. This refers to the width of the display screen in relation to the height. Now, we all know this. And why do I say that? Well, just, just have a look at this. Right? Um, this is your widescreen, this is your letterbox, and when you look at it here, now we know what you're talking about. So there's our widescreen. Remember what it's saying. This refers to the width of the display in relation to the height. So the first number deals with your width, the second number deals with your height. First number width, so the width in relation to the height. So that's how your image or your video is going to display. Then we have our contrast ratio. Now, this is defined as the ratio of the luminance of the brightest color in relation to the darkest color that the display can produce. That is your contrast ratio. Your response time is the amount of time a pixel in a display takes to change. It's measured in milliseconds. Obviously, you want that to be extremely quick. Okay. So these are some of the things you need to take into consideration when you're going to be buying a display device. Also, you need to look at the type of ports that the display device can take. Now, if we look at most TVs, um, most of them will come out with HDMI ports. And why? Because HDMI takes video and audio. Um, when you look at monitors for your PC and that, some of them will take... HDMI, they'll take VGA as well. Some of them will have two or three different types of inputs, but these are the things you need to consider and look at um, and ask yourself, well, what am I going to be doing with it? What am I going to be using it for? And that will definitely 
help you. Remember, big difference between the VGA and HDMI is VGA transmits video only. HDMI is video and sound. Right. Then we have our printers. Now, with printers, there are certain specifications. We look at things like speed, resolution, monthly duty cycle, the number of colors, the paper options, and the connections. So here, for example, is a color laser printer. Now, I can see that because this is toner. There I've got my black toner, and similarly to my inkjet printer, I've got three main colors that make up all the colors that I need. Um, cyan, yellow, and magenta. I know this is a laser printer because I can see the bold where the paper comes out over there and goes in at the bottom. Um, so that's how I identify this picture as a laser and a color laser for that matter. Now, laser printers are more reliable. They are easier to maintain. They are better for black and white, especially if you're going to be printing in bulk. Um, because they are cheaper to run, but more expensive to buy at the beginning. Your inkjets are cheaper to buy. They are more expensive to run and maintain. Um, but they are better for your photo quality prints. Okay, so just remember that because in grade 10, we already went through the difference between a laser and an inkjet. But now we bring in our 3D printers. So our 3D printers allow you to create physical three-dimensional objects using 3D modeling software. So this is the filament that is used. This is your printhead. And it's this filament that goes through the printhead onto this platform here to then create the three-dimensional object that you are printing. And this is known as your bolt plate. Please know this so that if you get a picture based on this, you know how to identify these things. Now, there are some advantages and disadvantages. Advantages, obviously, faster production, cost effective. You have complete control over the quality. You can tweak that. And you've got almost an unlimited design capacity. But it does require a lot of electricity. There is a high cost to purchase it. There's special material like that filament that you need to use. Um, and unfortunately, like with everything, it can be used to print some dangerous weapons okay we also have wireless technology in output devices so our wireless technologies wi-fi bluetooth nfc are used to increase flexibility and the usefulness of output devices so we can do wireless printing wireless video sound without wires as well okay so they just they just bring that in because some of us have wireless headphones right we do wi-fi printing which is using the technology that's there. Then we have our interactive whiteboards, this is something that comes up as well. You can see this is a special board. We've got our projector over here that shines the image on there. But the obviously the um, the main advantage of our interactive whiteboard is now I can actually um, write on the screen and it will actually save any notes that I make. I can then interact with whatever's been shown here on this particular board. So. And that is a massive, massive advantage because the computer functions can be manipulated on the board. There's better interaction and participation and notes made there, as I, as I mentioned, um, can be saved, right? And obviously with this, I can use a whole range of multimedia format, but there are distinct disadvantages. Um, like you need to have a dimly lit venue. The boards are sometimes difficult to read. Some of them are small at times. They don't use normal whiteboard markers. Um, you need to bear the cost in mind as well. And then suitable software is not always available. And like I said, this big one, big one. It's not affordable for many schools. As a result, repairs, um, because of all of this, repairs to something like this can be quite expensive as well. Unfortunately, the biggest disadvantage is that teachers themselves are sometimes hesitant of using the newer technology, especially teachers who have been there for 20, 30 years. Um, they are fine where they are with what they have. Some of them just are not interested in this as well. So what makes it all work? This is the big question. One of the things that makes it all work is something called drivers. Now, we did this in grade 10. A driver, what is it? It is a program. It is software that allows a computer to communicate with hardware or whatever devices and control them 
Now your operating systems have a large collection of standard drivers built in. This means that I can plug a device into my computer and Windows should be able to pick it up um, and get the relevant driver and then know how to work with it. The feature from the operating system that allows you to actually plug something in and use it is your plug and play. Now the operating system here automatically detects and configures a device. You know this when you work with your flash drives. You plug in your flash drive and it tells you a device has been inserted. Maybe it asks you to scan it and then you are able to use it. So the computer will check if it has the driver to control it and then move along with that process. And then I think the last section deals with, and this is a big one, um, the input and output for physically challenged users. Now, please bear in mind there is a difference between a visually impaired individual like myself who wears glasses as opposed to someone who is blind. They cannot see at all. Okay, This person can see. This person cannot see. So you need to read the question where that is concerned. For example, a Braille keyboard and Braille display device, that's going to be for someone who's blind, right? The person who needs a magnification device, what does that mean? They are just making whatever's on the screen larger, visually impaired. Large key keyboards, visually impaired. Braille printers, that's going to be for someone who is blind, okay? Please, please get the difference into your head. Same with hearing impaired and deaf, right? Um, a lot of you, when you're listening to your parents and they start shouting, you become hearing impaired because you don't quite hear what they say. <laughs> Unless some of you take the step to just um, pretend to be deaf. <laughs> yeah. As a parent, uh, we know how that works. <laughs> right. So if we get in on-screen notices or flashing screen instead of sound, that's going to be for someone who is deaf. Maybe a vibration device, Right. Um, for the hearing impaired, I can turn the volume up, but the volume is going to end up being quite loud. But that is an option for someone who is hearing impaired. Please, when somebody's deaf, you can't turn up the volume. Just saying. All right, motor control. We've got eye tracking devices. There are head movement devices, large key keyboards, large trackballs, and joysticks that can be used as well. So motor control, maybe the person is paralyzed maybe the person um, doesn't have full control over their their limbs as well um, that's that's all to do with motor control right um, here for example is a trackball here is a puff suck switch device this enables a quadriplegic user to control a computer simply by breathing simply by breathing here is a foot mouse. This device can be used by a user that has limited or no upper arm movement. Right? You see what's happening? Joysticks and trackballs. This is all to make sure that everyone can make use of the computing devices. Yeah, trackballs. You get different types of trackballs as well. Um, here's an example of a braille printer. So this printer prints embossing raised braille dots onto braille paper and then we also have our speakers and these can assist visually impaired learn uh, users um, and has special software you know that can convert text into speech and then what happens it is then broadcast in sound format okay so all of these things are there to to help folks and then we also look at the input and output and health issues so the way we sit and the way we use input devices can result in a sore neck, backache, headaches, and RSI, our repetitive strain injury. You shouldn't be sitting like this or like this. <laughs> Many of us do this, right? This is how you should be sitting. You see the back support over there. Um, I've seen this in some offices as well. Looks weird, but it works. And we've seen the introduction of um, height adjustable desks as well where people are standing and, and working it seems weird but uh, it does actually work so you need to manage your working style you know move around every hour or so don't stare at the screen for too long use keyboard shortcuts uh, do exercises to relieve tension in joints i mean some of you one day are going to be working in environments where you are in front of the computer quite a lot don't 
turn up the volume of the headphones and drown out surrounding sound. I know many of you walk around in shopping centers and outside there in the real world and you do this. But it's dangerous because, um, yeah, you don't hear anything around you. And that can be from a car, somebody trying to rob you, you know, anything like that. And then you also want to adjust the monitor settings and position so that it does not hurt your eyes. And folks, that is it for module 1.2.